My name is Simon Mirren. Um, I'm an executive producer and writer. I live in Los Angeles, California. Been here for 17 years. Um, I've written, produced, and directed uh, various different uh, shows. In London, uh, I oversaw. Uh, I was part of the Spooks team in season one. Um, Casualty, very early on. Waking the Dead, and I shifted over to Los Angeles. And my first project here was with, uh, Without a Trace. And then I moved on to Third Watch, which we filmed in New York, and then Criminal Minds. And then lastly, uh, I was responsible for creating a show called Versailles in Paris, France. In March, when uh, the, 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 the virus began, it, 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 I don't think we realized the, the, the enormity of what it was going to do to our business. Um, and then all of a sudden, the world seemed to stop. And... Uh, we're still trying to figure out five months later, how do we, how do we as a community rebuild? Uh, how, how as a community do we rebuild and figure our way? How do we tell stories now in, this, in, this, in these conditions? And it's, and it's an ever evolving and ever changing situation. I don't think any of us uh, in Los Angeles uh, uh, realized just how much uh, this pandemic would change everything. Um, or, or in so many different ways, not only how we film, how we ensure our crews, um, but also the sort of political landscape and, and the Black Lives Matter. None of us saw any of this coming. I mean, you literally couldn't write this. You know, we all feel here like finally we're in our own movie and we have no, and, we have, and, the, and the really scary thing is we don't even know what the ending's gonna be. We don't know where the middle of it is. We don't know nothing. We were all in, in this, we are all in this together. Um, but the difference, the difference of how the pandemic has, has affected the way that we uh, film here is very different to anywhere else, I believe. We have a different system um, than, in, than anywhere else. So I think it's very, very different. You can't, you can't liken uh, Hollywood filming to London filming on many, many levels. You just can't. Because because the, the, the numbers just they're just not the same. Um, insuring an actor in, in London is, is a lot less than insuring an actor here in, in Los Angeles. So, and also as, as we come to grips with the short-term effects of the virus, we have the long-term effects of the virus, who it's affecting most, and, 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 and we're having to look at the data of all those things. So, um, you know, really at the end of the day, all we can do right now is sit back and try and assess um, how we move in this current situation. The long-term ramifications for this virus, I honestly um, don't know. I think they're vast. Uh, and I think, you know, when we began this, it was simply how are we gonna get back to filming? Now it's like, what are we gonna film? And what are the stories that are we gonna tell? Because what's changed in all of this is, is the focus on, on who we all are now uh, as people, you know, in politics, in color, uh, in daily life, and and I think this virus has 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 hit so many points of of affluence, and you know I, I I'm a white affluent male living in the hills of Hollywood. I'm not living down in a project in Compton where this is much more devastating than it is for me. So how that affects the stories that we tell, I don't know. All I do feel is the people that need that most are validated to tell those stories are the youth. You know, I'm 54 years old. I think it's time for me to, to really give back to the youth to help them tell their stories. And I say that because I've seen the effect it's had on my children and I have children at different ages, different depths. So I see how that affects and how they can't go out and validate themselves as, as, as anyone, not just as storytellers, as anyone. So how, this, how the long-term ramifications and the psychological effect it will have on the people that tell stories I think it's really up to the youth. So for me, as I come out of this pandemic, my feeling is about giving more, giving back more as a storyteller and knowing how to tell stories to the to the youth, because I think it's their, I think it's their story now to tell. Before COVID began, um, I think the uh, our, our international global distribution filming business was already experienced a, a ground shift in the way that we all 
you know, not, not so much made television, but how we communicated, how we sold it around the world. So that was already, uh, that was already experienced a massive shift. And then this comes along. And what's interesting is I think, I would say now what happens is we're going to start reshoring things. I think the only way to move through this safely until there's a vaccine and even after there's a vaccine, I think we're going to have to start reshoring our, our, our content. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to reinvest in our own community rather than looking beyond looking at the international co-production model because the international co-production model right, right now absolutely does not work because everywhere else these pockets are still going to be happening everywhere. So I think, I think there's going to be a massive, I think reshoring is going to be the new catchphrase. And I think there's, that's a that's a that's a great thing. It's a bad thing as well because that we we can't sort of pollinate. We can't cross pollinate our ideas. We can't move around like we did. You know, for Netflix, Netflix was was shining a spotlight on, on all these countries that never had a spotlight put on them. Netflix was investing in all these different places, and that, that's why I love Netflix because they showed the talent from around the world, whether it be in Saudi Arabia, or in Africa. You know, there was such potential for that. Um, I think. And which there still will be, but I think we're going to have to reshore. Like in, in Los Angeles right now, we have one million people unemployed, one million storytellers. You know, from from the grips to to the camera guys to the actors, we have one million people unemployed, and and quite often we're always travelling from LA. I think we're going to have to reshore. We've got it all here. We've got the studios. We've got the cameras. We've got the storytellers. We can't travel. So so one answer to the problem we have now, if COVID, if there is no vaccine or the, or therapeuticals is to be able to, we're going to have to reshore everything here and, and invest in the people here until, you know, we, we get through this. Right before COVID, we were in the middle of a negotiation with the, the agents. And the way that we package television here is very different from anywhere else. Um, so we were on the edge of, 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 of basically a strike. And we we're about to say, look, you know, um, we're not okay with it, with it, with the way the contracts were. So, but I think the bigger agents have, can see the future of distribution and they realize that, that, it, current, that they realize that if they don't have uh, more ownership in their clients content, they're going to, they're going to see less and less reward. So then they would, so then what will happen is they realize, well, why don't we, first of all, they were already packaging shows and packaging means on Criminal Minds, they would package our show. So they they would help build the pilot. They would they get the cast and the, they get the cast and they take uh, they they would take a percentage of the show thereafter. So every single episode they take a piece, and that was you know we all understood that. Um, but now you know many many other shows, many many other writers didn't realise that they were that apparently that they were being packaged. So that became a, a, a problem in in the negotiation. So many many writers left their agents saying if you package i won't be with you because that's not right but on top of the packaging they also wanted to produce their clients content so now they've got a piece of the packaging and now they're going to become producers so and i think i think for my opinion of that is they realized that the the, the profit share was going to get smaller and smaller because residuals are about to go away so how can they be viable how can they move and how can they be more important in the clients their clients life than they were before because before it's basically an agent, like a sports agent still, you just got a percentage, whatever they got. You didn't get to own a part of the t-shirt or part of the team. You didn't get to own the ticket sales of, of the stadiums. So they were trying to make themselves viable because they'd become very powerful. So, you know, and, and all of these things are changed by the internet and, and the way that we communicate, which is the one thing that's kind of saved us in this pandemic. So one thing that we do now, tech industry is going to be, massive after this because we've all now so reliant on it so it's just how do we really at the end of the day, how do i own and control what i create and 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 you know and and have a, a clear contract so i know who gets what from what i've created so all those things are are happening at the moment but what happened with the, the with with covid is it shut down like wme invested heavily into sports so suddenly they look, they, they've bought into sports, they've leveraged a lot of their money into, into sports, and now there's no sports. So obviously that puts the writers at a better bargaining because, because we know that they're kind of like looking down the barrel and going, what are we going to do now? So I do think the negotiations will end well because actually because of this 
COVID situation, I think everybody's had time to really look at the, the reality of the situation we're in and where we're going and where we're now not going, you know. Because of COVID and then because of Black Lives Matter, what's happening now is here, if you try and pitch a cop show like Criminal Minds, they just don't want to hear it because they don't believe that the youth want to hear anything to do with cops, which is interesting because a massive, some of the biggest shows of the last 20, 30, 40 years on television, if you look at them anywhere in any country, they're cop shows. So all of a sudden, there's a feeling that cop shows now cannot, they don't want them. There's a monitorial, no cop shows, no matter what it is, no cop shows. So that's, that's something that I, I obviously really didn't see happening. Um, I don't know, for me, for me, great storytelling is great storytelling. Um, I don't think much will change in what I do, but as I was saying before, um, the thing that I'm really excited to see is how the Black Lives Matter and the youth and, and how they tell stories. And I don't think the wonderful thing is, I don't think we know what that is because I'm not 20. I'm not experiencing it in the same way they are because I'm 54, so I've had a long, great life. So, and, my, I'm, and I'm excited to explore and help the young minds figure out what stories they want to tell because they're probably not going to be the ones I want to tell. Do you see what I'm saying? Or he wouldn't even would, would even know how to. For me, I think at the end of the day, you know, um, I, I think there's going to be a kickback from the cop shows. I think a lot of those things are going to change. But I think, but but if I if we go, we have to reshore stories, and we have to be more authentic to the place that we tell those stories. That's going to be interesting because that changes everything. Do you know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden, like we realise that. Once we've reshored our community, I think, I think our stories are gonna be even more diverse, even more interesting. And there'll be some amazing storytellers, like for instance, I saw uh, Normal People, you know, and I was just, I, I didn't know who was in it. I didn't know who'd written it. I didn't know who'd acted it. And I, and I absolutely, one of the best things I've ever seen. It was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. The filming was extraordinary. The writing was beautiful. The actors were, were just great. I did used to think that I could read your mind at times. In bed, you mean? Yeah. And afterwards, but... I don't know, maybe that's normal. It's not. And that defied everything that I've been taught here, which is you've got, you've got to have a name, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. No, you don't. Actually, you don't have to have any of, uh, any of those things. You just have to some, have something that's absolutely authentic, absolutely beautifully written, absolutely beautifully acted. And then you've got normal people. So I think normal people in, well, I think we will remember normal people as one of the greatest shows told in the COVID experience. And that to me is the answer to all of it. Um, and I just want to add one more thing. You know, having grown up in England, uh, when I look back on community and storytelling and Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter has always mattered to me. I grew up in South East London, very diverse. But, you know, I had a little, I knew the Massive Attack guys a little bit many years ago. And when you look at Massive Attack and you look at the place where Massive Attack came from, it's, a, it's built on, on the base of slavery. Bristol is a slave port. And when you look at the, the, the diverse faces of Massive Attack, they're extraordinary. You, you know, in the, in the old days, you had Tricky, Mushroom, 3D, Daddy G. And you look at those faces and you look at how those guys communicated their art together, how they grew up together. Massive Attack even inspired Banksy. Um, and you realize that, that that's kind of, for me, is, is, is how we could be as a community. And if you look at those faces, like Madness and Specials, you don't have any bands like that anywhere, anywhere in the world other than England. They really, we have grown up together and we have shared our community and our differences. And I think that's kind of, for me, the way forward. I think that's, that's authentic, so original. And I think we're gonna, I hope we see more of that kind of storytelling because what, when Black Lives Matter here happened, I'd never seen so many white people together with black people fighting for the same thing. So I think that's going to be the answer moving forward. We would always have to go and pitch to the networks and we'd have to, we'd have to hear what they think is sellable. 
And I'm not, I'm not always, been, obviously I want them to buy my story. Of course I want them to buy my story. But a lot of the, you know, for, for too long, the faces of the people that said that's not sellable live in ivory towers. They have their name on a car park, they have their Porsche and they drive to their big house. I don't know if they really know, they're looking at data. You know, normal people is, again, to be boring, normal people is an example of something that obviously there was a group of people that realized how brilliant it was. But there are so many ideas, there are so many stories. I mean, can you, I can't even imagine the stories that are gonna come out from the kids that have lived this life right now of COVID. How, how, how's, how's, how, they, how have they been psychologically affected by this? So the stories that they tell will have a psychological imprint on the stories that we see later. As, as long as the people in the ivory towers and their faces change, and there's my, more diversity in their faces, there has to be more diversity because stories are diverse and, and, and stunning. You know, this little story out of Ireland, you know, it's like that could be anywhere. They just have to be white people. It could be black people in Detroit having the same experience. But unless the people at the top see the value of that, we're just going to, we're just, I, and by the way, I don't think it's going to, I think there's going to be a river of stories when we come out of this, because the only people that can do something are writers. They can sit there and write all day long. And, and, but I think it's important that, that the wheelhouse of, of our business changes dramatically to, 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 to try and find and, and really work at finding those authentic stories because there must be so many storytellers now desperate to tell stories. So that it's diversity and, and the diversity has to start at the top. And, but the problem with that is hard work. It's really hard work because it's not easy. It's really hard to find a really important writer because probably the most important writers of our times have shown us that they were never successful in their times like William Shakespeare. People don't identify straight away, they don't realize that they're, that they're, they're forward thinkers. So I think, I think on many levels, uh, we, we, we have to change the wheelhouse and how, 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 how we uh, find talent and support talent. And I think it's up to us now. I think for me, we've taken so much from the business. The, you know, anyone who's 30, 40 and 50 above in this business has made a lot of money. We need to give back to what we've just seen. We all need to go, hang on, we really need to support our youth. I mean, you only have to look at the UK and tell me, you know, it, it's, you know, there's no funding for people that have got no money to go to drama school. You know, when 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 they suddenly go, let's let's cut budgets at schools. They cut drama and music. They cut the arts. It's 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 ridiculous. We have to reverse that. You know, learning maths is great, but learning music is way more interesting, right? So we need to sort of. I think we have to also reevaluate our education system and start and, and start really investing in the youth and music and poetry and all those things that we make a lot of money out of. The whole of, the whole of Los Angeles is built on that. And yet the schools, if you go in there, the first thing they take is the, the instruments out because they're too much, no, let's go the other way. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. So I think on every level, we have to go back and rethink our education system, which was designed for the industrial revolution because that's not where we are anymore. And we really, and I think this time has made us really have time to think about the state of everything. <laughs>